everybody. Uh, welcome along to this project developers uh, question and answer session uh, and webinar on gold standard for the global goals. Uh, it's great to see uh, so many of you attending. It looks like the people joining the numbers have stabilized, so I'll dive right in. Um, the structure of the webinar today is that I'll speak for around 15 to 20 minutes to give an overview of GS for the global goals uh, and try and highlight some of the land use perspectives there specifically. So this is a land use focused webinar. Uh, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers uh, at the end. Um, a few points of housekeeping. Um, so some of you that will have joined the energy webinars already will have heard much of what I'm about to say. Um, and so apologies for the duplication, but we wanted to give a chance, room to breathe really for the questions from land use uh, developers particularly. Um, so I'm going to present uh, for around 15-20 minutes. You can ask questions, you should be able to see a GoToWebinar uh, on your GoToWebinar dashboard, a questions box where you can drop your questions in as I'm speaking or afterwards, entirely up to you. Um, if you do put a question in there, please could you avoid um, uh, kind of shorthand questions, they're difficult to, to follow during a webinar. So uh, quickest if you can just lay out exactly what you mean. Um, also, if you want to ask a question about a specific slide, maybe just add a, a short reference to the slide you're referring to. Um, I'm going to record this session. The session will be posted to the, the Gold Standard YouTube channel. Um, so if you go to YouTube and search for Gold Standard, you'll find uh, we have a channel and all of our recent webinars, presentations, consultation events, etc. Uh, are all posted there. So you'll be able to listen back to this webinar, uh, the webinar that I'll hold later on this evening, uh, GMT, uh, for the other time zones and land use. And also um, there's some webinars there around the energy project side and for auditors. Uh, so quite a lot of information on the YouTube channel of Gold Standard. I'll also circulate this recording and the links to some of the documents I refer to by email uh, next week as well. So we'll do a wrap-up email that captures uh, all the webinar links uh, and some of the document links that are, are most referred to. Um, and also we'll post a schedule of the questions asked and our, and our answers as well uh, so that we're making sure we're being consistent. So look out for an email from us next week um, uh, follows up on the uh, on the webinar. Um, so with that, I'll dive right in. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'll start here on the website. Uh, the new standard was published on the 10th of July. Uh, if you go to our standard on the website and standard documents, it will take you through to the new gold standard for the global goals um, uh, microsite where all the new uh, GS for GG documents are, are posted. Uh, so my internet's running a little slow here this morning, uh, but I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, you've hopefully seen at least where you can find that, and I'll come back and refer to it in just a moment. Try reloading it, see if that works. Yeah, there you go. So that's the microsite. Uh, in the microsite, you can find the standards documents there on the left hand side, and I'll walk you through those in a second. Uh, you'll find um, some support and FAQs. So this is where we'll post uh, the questions that are being asked and our consistent answers. Uh, the new fee schedule, which is very much based on the one that was released earlier this year, but with some updates for some of the new products. Uh, the new terms and conditions. Uh, we've really tried with the terms and conditions to make them feel uh, less legal, if, if that's possible, with terms and conditions. We've tried to write those in plainer English than previous versions, so hopefully that helps. And you'll find the global glossary as well that cross-refers all documents. Um, so there's a glossary that sort of sits there on the left for all. Uh, for all. Um, uh, so I'll just hop across to my presentation deck uh, and walk you through uh, some of this. So as I say, welcome along. Oh, one more thing to say on housekeeping, apologies. Uh, you can also submit questions to, to us anytime uh, do reach out to your regular contact or help at goldstandard.org. Um, we are we may take a, a day or two to respond um, because we are making sure that we respond to those queries in a consistent way and we record them so that we can add them to our FAQs uh, page on the website. So bear with us. Uh, we're, we're answering as quickly as we can, but we really want to make sure everybody's getting the uh, same consistent answers all the way through. Um, so that's enough of housekeeping. Uh, welcome to Gold Standard for the Global Goals. Uh, before I dive into uh, the detail on GS for GG, I want to take a moment to sort of show off a little bit, really, some of the names that have been involved, some of our new strategic partners, um, uh, some huge names on here that really add some gravitas and credibility to the Gold Standard efforts. Uh, we've really reconnected with our colleagues at WWF. Uh, we have a strategic partnership with the World Bank Group. You'd have seen our strategic collaboration with the UNFCCC uh, recently on the website, and we're working closely with colleagues over at CDP and science-based targets. Um, so uh, I'm not showing this only to show off, although we're very proud of our efforts uh, in reaching out to partners, but also 
I really wanted to highlight some of the efforts that have gone on behind the scenes to build brand strength and credibility and gravitas of gold standard. Um, and you'll see the benefits, hopefully, of that as uh, as the standard grows and, and, and market demand builds. Um, I think that's a really important aspect of our recent work. Um, so what is gold standard for the global goals? Well, we've called it next generation. And what really we mean by next generation is that is effectively that it's a modular standard. Um, so what we've, what we've tried to do is to take the existing elements of gold standard uh, standards, such as energy, land use and water, and break them apart and put them back together again in the right consistent order. So one of the things we found when I took over as uh, chief technical officer here is that we operated uh, five or six different standards. So gold standard meant five or six, at least five or six different things to different user groups. So we had the earlier versions of energy, we had land use and forests, so agriculture and, and AR, and we had the water benefit standard, all individually very competent, high quality standards, uh, and all doing very similar things. So all involving safeguards and stakeholder consultation, uh, but all doing them in slightly different ways. And so the, the what gold standard stands for in principle terms I was a little inconsistent across those standards. Um, and so we wanted to correct that. Uh, we also wanted to uh, create greater flexibility of certification pathway and hence the move towards a more modular approach. Um, and so what do I mean by modular? Well, I mean that uh, we've taken those, uh, those existing standards, we've analyzed what's in them, and we've broken those apart into, um, into key modules that create the certification uh, pathways for different project types. So on the left hand in the green boxes there, the two core modules, the principles and requirements and activity requirements, they're mandatory to all projects. And I'll come on to what those contain in a minute. Uh, but they really define consistently what gold standard stands for in terms of best practice in project development. And then on the right hand side, uh, the methodologies and the products. Um, so we've transitioned across all of our existing uh, methodologies for emissions reductions and water benefits and black carbon and A-dailies. Um, and there's no need to re-review any of those methodologies if you're using them. Uh, they've not changed. They've simply been uh, moved across. Uh, and the products, so if you want to issue carbon credits, for example, uh, the rules and requirements of carbon credits would, would be in that module. Um, so for those of you that have been using the AR standard, which on this webinar will be most of you, you'll, you'll, you'll quickly realize that all of those elements were wrapped up in one document um, in, in the original AR 0.9 version. So, for example, if you're looking now for the uh, emissions reduction methodology section of the AR standard, that's been separated out into a standalone method methodology module, and I'll show you where to find that in a second. Um, so what that does is breaks the standard up into modules. Um, the, the, there's two things, there's two value adds there, I suppose, that are, that are key to note. Uh, one is if you're, you know, the, the astute amongst you will already have picked up that if methodologies and products are optional, that means gold standard will now certify the project as a project only pathway. So we no longer insist that you follow a methodology and issue something. Uh, and I know that's been attractive to some, uh, some land use projects who aren't necessarily looking to issue carbon credits. Um, so that's quite exciting. There is a demand for that just at the project level, but but I'll show you later in this webinar how that 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 gives us more flexibility and leads to other areas of uh, of, of finance and demand that we can generate by doing that. Um, so I'll quickly um, sorry the other the other benefit of this is the the greater flexibility of pathways. So at the moment um, in land use we have only carbon credit methodologies and products, uh, but you can quickly realise here that by breaking this up and making it a more flexible pathway. It means we can develop uh, develop more options for you as project developers uh, to access different areas of finance or to use the projects in different contexts. So just very quickly before I continue, I'll just show you where to find those modules on the website. So if you go to standard documents in the microsite that I just showed you, you'll find uh, the different modules are laid out here. So the core principles and requirements applicable to everybody, the activity requirements, and in here I'll just click through. You can see the land use and forestry activity requirements there in the middle. So that's where some of the specific rules for land use and forests, such as uh, you know, legal title uh, requirements, for example, uh, they all live in there. Um, if you're looking for the methodologies, they'll be, they're there in the middle of the 400 series, um, and they're all laid out here. And you can find uh, there's the AR program. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong one, isn't it? Uh, let me just scroll down and uh, find you the AR methodology. Um, so there's the agriculture methodology for smallholder dairy, for example, if you've been using that. Uh, I can't lay my eyes on the AR one right now, but it's in there, I assure you. 
Um, so you'll find the methodologies in there. And then uh, if you're looking for the rules and requirements around carbon credits, which were also part of the, the standard, then they're, they're there in product requirements. So this is pretty an in, a pretty intuitive microsite. You should be able to find your way around. Uh, but if you're stuck trying to find out what happened to a rule or what happened to a certain part of your documentation, uh, do just drop us a line, help at goldstandard.org, and we can help out with that. Um, one just to highlight that doesn't necessarily affect you guys as uh, as project developers right now is contextual requirements. Uh, they're a slightly unusual one. They sit somewhere in the middle. At the moment, the only one is gold standard for sustainable urban development. So how to apply gold standard for the global goals in a city's context, uh, specifically large scale cities programs for you know, investment funds or uh, municipal authorities. I'm highlighting that here, not because um, any of you necessarily are interested in cities, but I'll come back to context requirements when I talk about some of the, the innovations we're about to bring forward because there is some relevance for land use there. Um, so those are the, the, the four key modules. So setting aside context requirements a second, those are the four key modules. All of the elements really that were in the AR uh, requirements, uh, you know, map quite nicely across these requirements and, and all of the existing rules in AR and agriculture are trans transferred across to one or more of those documents. Um, so not a huge amount changes in terms of the day-to-day -day of land use rules, uh, but I'll come on to some of those, those tweaks in a minute. Um, so just to highlight what's in the core requirements first, uh, as I said, when we, when we assessed the standard, what we really wanted to do was analyze and pick out what are the core principles of gold standard that should be consistent regardless of which activity you are, whatever, you know, whether you're a wind farm or, a, or, or an actual agriculture farm, you know, what are the core principles of gold standard and how are we being consistent? And the five principles here really speak to that. The contribution to climate security and sustainable development. Uh, you know, in energy, we had contributions to the Millennium Development Goals. In land use, we had the Sustainable Development Assessment. Uh, and in water, we had the SDGs. So we've really brought that together into principle one. Uh, principle two is safeguards. You'll be very familiar from a land use perspective with the sustainability assessment. And many of those safeguards are transitioned across the gold standard for the global goals, uh, in some cases enhanced, in other cases rationalized. Uh, but we've tried to be consistent with the safeguards. And I'll come on to how that works shortly. Uh, stakeholder consultation. So gold standard very much stands for stakeholder engagement and inclusivity. Uh, that was a very strong, uh, if not the strongest part of uh, the, our land use standards. Uh, and so we, we've obviously transferred that across. Uh, principle four is about uh, demonstration of real outcomes. And that's really where the certification cycle and audit approach comes in. So how do we make sure that MRV is being done right? And how are we assessing and certifying against it? And then principle five, additionality and ongoing financial need. That's really there. And I'll come back to this shortly. That principle is, is kind of an optional principle, depending on what certification pathway you're following. Uh, so if you're not issuing carbon credits or any other type of commercial product, uh, then additionality isn't required to be proved. Uh, but for certain products like carbon credits, we stand by additionality as a, as a mandatory requirement. So principle five is something we stand for uh, if the certification pathway demands it. And I'll come back to explain a little bit about how that works uh, in this presentation. Uh, and then the flexible elements, as I say, really the methodologies have all been carried across from earlier versions. Now, there was no standalone methodology in AR. Uh, as many of you know, that methodology was effectively embedded in the AR requirements. Uh, but what we've done is created an AR emissions reduction or sequestration methodology. Uh, but the methodology is the same as what was in AR. It just stands alone in its own document now. And the reason for that is uh, to give you guys the flexibility if you choose not to issue carbon credits then the standard doesn't demand that you follow that methodology anymore. Uh, so just, it just creates that flexible pathway system. Uh, we are also creating new SDG methodologies. Uh, so at the moment, the only one in AR and agriculture are emissions reductions. But later this year, and I'll come back uh, at the end in our new initiatives to talk about this, is our gender responsive framework. And you can well imagine in the future that new SDG methodologies uh, like water um, or um, food security, maybe biodiversity, uh, depending on which way we decide uh, that uh, we can build demand for land use projects, you can well imagine new methodologies and uh, SDG tools being created as, as required and where demand exists. Um, uh, so it also allows us to create some new products. I highlight here the renewable energy certificate labeling that we're doing for renewable energy projects. I appreciate that's not of relevance technically to forest projects or agriculture projects, but it's worth highlighting, I think, because what it means is a diversification of what renewable energy projects can go and choose as their market mechanism, which has a kind of knock-on effect to you guys in land use in that 
uh, that should be reduced heat from those renewable energy projects in the market. So as they shift to labelled IREX, uh, they'll obviously be issuing fewer VERs and therefore the idea would be that they still have somewhere to go and sell their products um, uh, under gold standard, uh, but you know, hopefully reduce some of the competition for some of those very large uh, renewable energy projects for yours. Um, so this is a slightly busy slide, but I wanted to lay out what that flexible pathway really means. Um, uh, some of you, if you're involved in, say, Cookstow projects, you know, you'll be able to follow the core principles and requirements and the community service activity requirements. And then you've got a few methodologies available for you. You've got the emissions reduction methodology and you've got the health methodology. And you could choose to issue carbon credits and or uh, a dailies. Now, I appreciate this is a land use uh, webinar, but I wanted to highlight that example because it, I think it shows uh, some of the potential uh, for further development in forest and agriculture that we could do. You could imagine a similar flexible system being developed. Uh, but there at the, the bottom, you can see um, uh, the land use activity requirements. They carry across the specific rules and requirements and eligibility criteria from AR and agriculture. So, for example, that that's where we uh, we note what an eligible AR project is, you know, in, in, in what, what the plantation requirements are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you have the, the emissions reduction methodologies and you can issue carbon credits. Uh, but in future, you can well imagine further pathways being developed to access different markets uh, or to be used in different contexts. So it's, a, it's an exciting kind of revolution, I suppose, uh, of gold standard in that sense. Um, the certification cycle, uh, this is a, a busy slide. And so I'll, I obviously will we'll circulate these slides so people can read this in more detail. It's also in the standard itself. Uh, but the certification cycle for land use is actually largely unchanged. Um, so you, you may have picked up that generally gold standard for the global goals switches to a five-year uh, certification cycle. Well, land use was already a five-year certification cycle. Um, and so we've actually brought ourselves generally in line with land use because uh, we felt that that system worked really well. Um, uh, it's kind of been pioneered in land use, uh, it's kind of trailblazed really. And also five years aligns with the principle of the Paris Agreement, which is a five-year reporting cycle as well. Um, but just briefly, uh, it's, it's still very much an ex-ante and ex-post system comparing project scenario to baseline and then monitoring the project scenario parameters to be able to, to continue certification. Um, I'll quickly walk through this. Some of the terminology has changed, so maybe just to highlight that first. Uh, the first uh, terminology change is that PFA is now called preliminary review. Um, the reason for that, I, I appreciate you know, terminology changes can be a bit of a pain, but we wanted to be consistent across the standards that are coming into gold standard for the global goals. So we all, uh, all those different versions I mentioned earlier used PFA to mean slightly different things. And so we've updated it under the header of preliminary review. Uh, but basically, the system will be very similar to what it always has been for land use uh, PFAs. Uh, so with preliminary review, you will be able to list as a gold standard project. You'll then hire a GSVVB. And that's another new term that is a catch-all term for any audit firm that's recognized by gold standard. Uh, so at the moment in uh, AR, for example, you can hire a DOE uh, with forestry scope or you can hire an FSC certification body. They're both viable uh, auditors. Uh, and we wanted to create one term that kind of captures all of those. And the term we've chosen is GS, Validation and Verification Body, so GSBVB. Uh, and there'll be a list of those on the website. I'll come on to that again in a second. Uh, and then assuming the validation goes well, uh, we will then conduct a design review, which leads to project design certification. Um, so we've swapped out the term initial certification and uh, registration to, to be design review and design certification. Um, the reason for that is we wanted to be more intuitive with what it means. So registration doesn't necessarily mean a great deal uh, to, to people new to the standard. And so we wanted to show that the project design has been certified. Uh, and we really wanted to highlight clearly that that's a certification step, not just an administrative step. Um, so hence project design certification. We've reduced the timeline there, actually. Um, there's a few efficiencies, which I'll list in a second. Uh, but we've reduced the design review from six weeks to four weeks. So we've been able to find a little bit of efficiency there. Uh, and then you, you, you flip onto the ex post system, uh, which is where you go into uh, ex post monitoring of the project. And that's a five year cycle. Uh, very little changes for land use. Um, so you have to verify uh, on the fifth year for AR projects. Um, and you have to verify within two years of implementation for everything else. Um, you uh, have to submit an annual report for years that you're not verifying, but that's not a change for land use. That's already a, a requirement. 
Uh, we've changed the, um, uh, the, the one thing we have changed is that the, you have to renew your certification every five years, typically for projects under gold standard for the global goals. That means a reassessment of baseline and a demonstration of ongoing financial need. But under the land use requirements, neither of those things is required. So in effect, the fifth year renewal is just part of your normal fifth year of your verification. You can, of course, verify more, more frequently than that, but the five years is the minimum. Um, so actually, very little change is ex post in terms of the cycle for, uh, for land use projects. And um, I think uh, you guys and the land use team in Gold Standard uh, can feel a little bit of pride, I think, that, um, that the rest of Gold Standard has come around to that way of thinking rather than, uh, rather than requiring you guys to switch to theirs, um, which is no mean feat given there's nearly a thousand uh, energy projects on a slightly different cycle. Um, so we really, we really like the five-year cycle. We think um, that under the Paris Agreement, we, we fully expect to see the other standards align with that. So we really, we're kind of jumping ahead of the queue and, and trying to pioneer this as, as Gold Standard always has done. Um, there are some efficiency gains. I can't stress enough how much easier it is as Secretariat of Gold Standard to manage one standard rather than several. Uh, I know many of you have been suggesting efficiency improvements and see some frustration historically at um, some of the processes and procedures at Gold Standard. Uh, but therein lies the challenge really for, for us managing seven or eight different versions is that uh, if I give an efficiency in one, I have to tailor that efficiency to every single version of the standard to make sure everybody benefits. And of course, that's time consuming and difficult and requires different layers of approvals and stakeholder consultation. So managing one standard and requiring everybody to use it really allows us to innovate with efficiency and for everybody to benefit. And I can bring forward more innovations because I have to spend less time doing the same innovation in, in five, six, seven different ways. Um, so that managing the one standard from a resource perspective, from a reviewer perspective, will make a massive difference. I can't stress that enough. Um, we've also introduced some streamlined certification procedures. So um, uh, we are we are moving to a more professionalized and efficient roster of experts system uh, for the gold standard design review and performance review that allows us to bring forward those reviews more quickly and to provide better training and quality assurance. So really hopeful that um, that you guys will see the benefit of that in your in your forthcoming reviews uh, as time goes along. Uh, we're also, and I'll come back to this in just a second, introducing a new system uh, to recognize and train uh, validation verification bodies. Um, the microsite itself there on the right hand side, I think is a great efficiency boost as well. Um, our old website uh, was kind of riddled with hundreds of PDFs that weren't necessarily simple to find. Um, but now that the microsite's much more intuitive and, and, and easily navigable, uh, and hopefully you'll find your way through that um, pretty quickly. Um, we were asked a question the other day whether you can download the documents. You can. There's a little print icon in the top right of each screen that you can download those documents. And we're looking at how you can download multiple documents at once. That might take a little bit of time to introduce that function, but that's something that um, we've been asked for, and we'll look at that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and then lastly, uh, some new IT technology coming online as well. We're looking at how the workflow is managed. So I know many of you have engaged with us on Dropbox and Google Drive and Podio and various other things. Um, so we're looking how to unify that under our CRM uh, to make things uh, more efficient, put it in one place uh, and allow everybody to benefit from that. So look out for work stream, uh, sorry, work process flow efficiencies too. Uh, and then there's some new IT tools coming up, um, and we hope to, to implement these in land use too shortly. But the first example will be the Cookstove IQ. That's a, uh, an online system for entering the methodological parameters for Cookstove emission reductions. Um, I know not all of you will be in, engaged in Cookstove projects, but it'll be worth taking a look at that in August when it's published, uh, because you can well imagine um, something similar for AR projects, for example, that will make reporting much, much more straightforward and consistent. Um, so excited to bring a lot of these things forward. Um, like I say, managing one standard, you'll you'll see more and more efficiencies uh, coming forward in the coming months and years, uh, which which is a really exciting time. Um, I wanted to walk through some of the key changes in the standard. I won't dwell on these. This isn't uh, this webinar is not intended to go into a lot of technical depth. Um, I should have mentioned at the start there'll be a training webinar on the second of August, which will be recorded. Uh, so you can listen back to it. That will go into the, the standard in more detail than this. Uh, but I wanted to just highlight some of the key changes anyway. Um, I'll do that by principle. So under principle one, um, actually in land use, uh, you have to demonstrate some positive contributions to sustainable uh, development. I think it's three contributions um, in the AR standard. Uh, that's not changed really in the new standard. You have to contribute to climate security through 
uh, mitigation or adaptation. Uh, the only difference to historical is that you don't have to do that by issuing carbon credits, uh, but that is one route. And then you have to demonstrate two positive contributions to, uh, to two other SDGs. Um, so no more than you had to do before, but we'll be using the consistent language of the SDGs rather than uh, our own matrix, uh, just to, to kind of catch hold of that global momentum that's uh, behind it. Uh, safeguarding principles. So you had a sustainability assessment rather than a do no harm assessment, which had a series of safeguarding requirements. Uh, you'll recognize many of those safeguards in the new safeguarding principles have been carried directly across, uh, for example, for things like GMO or animal husbandry or uh, harvesting of forest products, for example, have all come straight from land use. And we've tried to rationalize some of the language there. Um, the safeguards document at first review is daunting. It looks long and onerous, um, and it looks like more than you had to do before. But I would stress that the idea of that document is that you will apply the requirements that are relevant to your project type. So, for example, if you're a forestry project, you're unlikely to have to deal with um, uh, disruption to uh, electricity to supply to users, for example. So there's a requirement in there for that. It's really not going to be relevant to uh, AR projects, and so it can be justified to, to be ignored um, uh, instead of um, demonstrated. Uh, and what we did when we assessed the safeguards for the different project types is we found that there were no more relevant safeguards for a typical uh, AR project or cookstove project, for example, than there were under the previous versions. So although the total number of requirements have gone up, when you apply them, what you'll very likely find is within you know within one or two requirements, there's very few uh, very few project typical projects that will have more to do than they did before. So it is also longer because we've tried to provide more clarity on what the safeguard means. So rather than just giving a kind of broad generic, you must do better with gender issues, we've tried to be a bit more specific on that. That creates a lengthier document, but hopefully one that's easier to interpret. Um, Stakeholder consultation, again, little has changed. You'll find that very recognizable from previous versions. I think probably the biggest change there is, or two biggest changes rather, one is that we require you to consider whether there's any affected stakeholders, so not just local stakeholders, but affected stakeholders. You can imagine a very large farming practice change project affecting water use in a basin, for example, um, and that might be outside the project boundary. Um, so we just require you to think about whether there's anybody affected outside the boundary in most cases, unlikely to be, uh, but you know that that's there and it's required to be considered. Um, I think that's a, a useful bit of new best practice that, again, we expect others to follow. Uh, and the other is to, uh, a stronger consideration of gender sensitivity issues. Um, so very much considering women's access to consultations and providing their feedback. Uh, also male issues as well, but um, you know, predominantly thinking about how we better um, engage with women and make sure that women's issues and women's views are addressed and captured in projects. Um, so there's a little bit of extra work to do there. I would hope that all of you will agree with us that um, that embedding uh, latest gender best practice is, you know, is well worth that, that small amount of extra effort. And again, you know, we're the only standard in the markets that are really, you know, that have really come forward with that recently. And, and you'll be able to claim a, a kind of gender sensitive claim around that, uh, which you won't be able to claim anywhere else. So a little bit of extra work, but I, I would hope that everybody will agree um, in, in the kind of context of the modern world that that's a necessity. Um, demonstration of real outcomes is really the certification cycle I just presented. Uh, and then financial additionality. So uh, all projects seeking carbon credits or other products um, that are kind of commercialized uh, will be required to prove financial additionality. We do that with the same CDM tools as before and the same uh, additionality options that you had in AR and agriculture. So nothing's changed in the way you prove financial additionality. Uh, ongoing financial need doesn't really affect you guys as land use developers either. Uh, but just to briefly explain what that is, um, at the five-year renewal uh, of certification for, for projects, uh, we'll require them to prove that they still need the money from uh, gold standard certification. Uh, so you still need this, the financial support that gold standard VERs bring, for example. Uh, the reason for that is uh, what we're finding as time moves on is that some project types are in marketplaces or countries where that market has been transformative. Those projects are profitable and sustainable on their own merits. Now, I, you know, I think most of us would agree forests aren't in that place yet, uh, but you could imagine something like uh, you know, some of the renewable energy projects in, say, Chile or Taiwan. You know, those, those, those are really very sustainable, um, uh, profitable projects. And so we want to make sure that uh, you know, 
they, they still need the money. So it doesn't mean they weren't additional in the first place, but it means they still need the money going forward. Now, the benefit to you guys of that is that it, it removes projects from the carbon credit market ongoing uh, that, that are kind of distracting and diverting uh, monies away from uh, projects like forests that are in more need of it. Um, those projects will still have somewhere to go, as I mentioned earlier, would be labeling IREX. So obviously, as you can imagine, we need to be sensitive to all our stakeholders and make sure nobody is, is kind of booted out of the standard with no, no place to go. Um, but just to stress, uh, ongoing financial need isn't a requirement for AR projects. Um, we're also introducing a new VVB requirements document, and that um, tightens up a little bit how auditors are approved to join gold standard. Um, basically, what it means is that uh, uh, auditors with a recognized accreditation and scope, such as DOE status or FSC certification body status, uh, can apply to gold standard, demonstrate their team and their competence, uh, and enter into our performance monitoring system. Uh, and that will mean that they're eligible to take on gold standard projects. Um, for you guys as project developers, uh, nothing changes. If you've signed up to uh, an agreement with an auditor right now, that, that audit will stand. There's nothing to change. If you have a legal agreement in place, you don't have to do anything. Nothing will change. Uh, as of the 1st of November, there will be a list of eligible auditors that you can go and, go and look at and you can approach those uh, for new agreements. Um, we hel held the first VVB webinars last week and had overwhelming attendance, and it's been overwhelmingly supported so far as a as a mechanism. But we will make sure there's no gap in service. So if we find that uh, people aren't joining that new scheme, then uh, then obviously we'll do something about that to make sure there's no gap in service. Uh, I think the other benefit to you guys uh, as as land use developers is that we can look at how we recognise. Uh, more accreditations. So, for example, in Australia, we might recognise uh, ARF accredited auditors uh, to better suit that context. And so, if there's if there's audit accreditations uh, that are out there that you think might be applicable to gold standard, uh, then do let us know. Um, and so, some upcoming milestones. So, we we are requiring all projects to transition to gold standard for the global goals. Um, there's two key reasons for that. Uh, one is, I mentioned earlier, the management of one standard makes our lives much easier at Secretariat and lets us in improve our service and drive more efficiencies for, for you guys to benefit from. So it's a little bit of short-term pain to transition, uh, but the long-term benefit for everybody is, is, far, is going to far outweigh that. Uh, the other reason is... Um, the previous versions of the standard variously refer to the Kyoto Protocol or the Millennium Development Goals and other out-of-date mechanisms. And so what we don't want is for people to be on a, on a long crediting cycle, still effectively reporting uh, to the Kyoto Protocol long after um, uh, the Paris Agreement has been ratified and, and embedded or, or you know, still reporting Millennium Development Goal progress against the Sustainable Development Goals when they're nearly closed. Um, so you know, there's, a, there's a technical reason to transition as well. Um, the transition process will be kept really very simple. We're looking to do that between the project developers and the gold standard and not involve the auditors. So there's no extra audit cost. It'll be entirely desk-based. We'll be providing uh, information and guidance on on templates and checklists, um, but I fully expect our projects to fairly easily transition across. You know, some of the key areas might be um, updating your sustainable development contributions to the language of the SDGs, uh, checking whether any safeguards have changed that you need to look at, uh, but largely um, the transition is expected to be simple. And I think in land use particularly, uh, where so many of the safeguards and the certification cycle already aligns, it should be a very straightforward task for projects to transition across to, to gold standard for the global goals. Uh, we won't be expecting people to prove they've met every requirement or every line of gold standard for the global goals. Uh, there'll be a lot of kind of grandfathered assumptions where you know, if a previous requirement was met, then, then we'll, we'll continue to assume that it's been met. Uh, we also won't require anybody to try and retrospectively prove something. So for example, um, you know, you can't go back and do your pre-start stakeholder consultation. So you can't go back and embed those gender sensitive issues that I just mentioned into that process. That's not going to restrict you from joining the new standard. Uh, so the process will be fill out uh, a short amount of uh, documentation uh, where required. That's all captured in the transition requirements on the microsite. And you can go and take a look at what that includes. And then Gold Standard will review it, and uh, then it will be decided upon at the next uh, available verification. I'll come on to the dates in a second. Um, so just some of the key dates. We published the standard on the 10th of July. That's what you can see now on the website. And it comes into effect on the 14th of August for new projects. So from that date, new projects can choose to use Gold Standard for the global goals. 
Um, the next key date is the 1st of November. Um, so up until the 1st of November, any project that's been submitted to the gold standard process, regardless, so if it's in PFA or listing or validation or in, in initial certification review, if you're in any of those steps before the 1st of November, you can continue to register under AR 0.9. There's literally nothing you need to do up until the 1st of November if you're in the process already. After the 1st of November, if your project is, is submitted for the first time after the 1st of November, if it's a totally new project, then it'll be a gold standard for the Global Goals Project, and that's the standard you will apply. Um, so 1st of November is a pretty critical date in that sense. Um, so if you're already in process before that date, you don't need to do anything. You can. You can choose to transition across and use the new requirements, but you don't have to. Um, so look out for the 1st of November date. And then the next critical date is the 1st of March 2018. That's the date after which you have to transition to gold standard for the global goals at the next available verification. So to stress there, that's the you don't need to transition on the 1st of March. That's not a deadline per se. If your next verification is in 2019, that's totally okay. That's when we'll do it. You can do it before that. As I mentioned, it's a kind of desk-based exchange between uh, the developer and gold standard. So you can do it before the next verification. Uh, but the, the next verification after the 1st of March 2018 is when we have to do it. Um, and like I say, don't be too daunted by that process. We really are looking to keep that simple. Um, so I know the dates can be a little bit confusing. If you're worried about where your project is right now and which standard you should apply and what will happen at your next issuance, etc., cetera, et cetera, um, then do drop us a line at Help at Gold Standard and we'll straighten that out for you. Uh, but the the watchword or the, the guiding principle for all of this is that um, you know if you're midstream or and about to certify or validate or whatever, we're not going to be expecting you to change something in the immediate future. It's only after the first of November for new projects that you have to do that. Um, so um, I would try and appease or you know allay everybody's concerns really that um, there's going to be suddenly a, a load of extra work to do because that's really not what we're trying to do, and we'll work with you to avoid that. Um, so I'll skip over the energy projects uh, just to let you know that there's some changes to energy projects. If you missed the energy uh, webinars and you are also doing energy projects, they're posted to the Gold Standard YouTube channel uh, and you can go back and listen to that. Uh, for land use projects, um, just a couple of, uh, of, of issues. So in the main, most things are not changed. So there's very few changes to the core land use requirements that you'll know from previous versions. The biggest change really for you guys to get your heads around is the, the new structure of documentation rather than necessarily the rules and requirements. Uh, but there are a few changes. So we've changed some terminology. Um, so in, in merging the standards together under gold standard for the global goals, we're moving away from the language of CO2 certificates that was in land use and you know, unifying that with GSVER for validate, sorry, for verified and planned emission reduction for validated. Uh, and the reason we've done that is because if we're operating one standard and one set of requirements for carbon credits and the terminology needs to be aligned. So you'll come across the term PER, planned emission reduction, that really is uh, replacing validated CO2 certificates and you'll come across GSV, uh, and that's really replacing valid, uh, verified uh, CO2 certificates. Uh, but functionally, those things remain as they always have been. So you, you won't, there's no difference to the functionality of either of those units. Uh, it's just that we've, we've unified the terminology. Uh, we welcome feedback on planned emissions reductions, incidentally. Um, it's a new term we've introduced, and we're interested in thoughts on that. Uh, one sort of big change, I suppose, is that uh, for validate, what were validated certificates, now planned emission reductions, uh, we'll limit the issuance of those to five years forward period. So historically, we've allowed, uh, in fact, we've required the issuance of validated certificates for the whole project life, 30 to 50 years in, in forestry. Uh, what we found is that developers have had uh, difficulty selling those. Um, it creates you know, quite a large bubble of a market with a lot of certificates that kind of devalue each other or not devalue each other but make it difficult to sell in an open market uh, and and certainly the, the very very far forward ones um, are, are very difficult to sell just because uh, you know typically a corporate wouldn't want to buy something from 2050 for example it doesn't make sense um, so we're limiting that to a five-year forward period and we hope that'll make them uh, a tighter more attractive market uh, it also uh, helps gold standard manage its liabilities better um, uh, but uh, as a kind of um, added value recognizing we're taking something away there as an added value we're going to be shortly issuing something called bundled planned emission reductions and that allows you to purchase a gsvr or cer uh, to, to bundle with the planned emission reduction 
uh, and to sell it as a genuine carbon offset as opposed to an, exe- a, an expected ton of sequestration. So we know that's appealing to a lot of a lot of you have already reached out to us and said that's a, an appealing thing, and we'd be happy to share more views on that uh, as time goes along. But that's something we're, we're going to be rolling out uh, for your feedback shortly, um, and we you know so welcome feedback on that. Um, the other so so those two things you know if you're astute you'll probably notice what the reason for those two things going hand in hand. Uh, you know, if we bundle PERs right through the the life cycle of a project, so if you bundle the ones for 50 years forward, then it's almost a perverse incentive not to carry on with a project because you've already got your carbon offset. Uh, so limiting it to five year forward issuance and allowing bundle PERs kind of has a rolling incentive as well. So uh, we don't want to disincentivize the continuation of projects. Obviously, that's not where we wanted to get to with those new products. Uh, but excited to introduce that and, and and welcome any thoughts you might have on how how best to to use those new certificates. Um, I wanted to wrap up quickly, just a few minutes on where we're going next and some of the more relevant um, initiatives and strategic direction uh, points that are coming up. Uh, there's three key areas really we're focusing on. One is that we, have, we want to ensure that we are relevant and future-proofed against what's happening in the carbon markets and with the Paris Agreement. So uh, you know, I don't need to tell you the uncertainty around what that Paris Agreement policy means, what it means for double counting versus nationally determined contributions, what does additionality mean, what the baselines mean. There's lots of uncertainty there. And so that's a, a strong area of focus for us. And again, having one version of the standard allows that that has to be consistent on that and really drive change. Uh, we also want to build demand for carbon credits as well as find new areas of funding, new uses of the standard uh, and other SDG impact funding areas that you, you can choose to apply to. Um, and so there's some movement and some new strategic opportunities there as well. Uh, and then lastly, as always, we're committed to improving service and, and, and reducing complexity. Um, and so uh, some of you will already have met our new senior land use manager, Giancarlo, in Berlin. Um, Giancarlo is working hard at the moment to analyze the process, review all the templates and see how we can make those simpler and easier to apply. Um, so if you have any thoughts on that, um, yeah, we welcome those. E- either email uh, Giancarlo or help at goldstandard.org. Um, so what is coming next? Well, we're, we're going to be working hard on uh, future proofing ourselves against the carbon market. And also, you know, Gold Standard is, is there to show leadership and try and try and influence policy and, and, and you know, guide people towards what, what the right thing to do is. Uh, so this, uh, this autumn, look out for um, consultations and inputs and feedback on um, how we assess double counting against the nationally determined contributions and what that means. Uh, we'll be exploring uh, alternative products to carbon credits, such as emission reduction statements, where double counting is unavoidable. So you might find countries that it's just simply not possible post-2020 to uh, transfer carbon credits just just due to the way the the NDC accounting works. So how will we overcome that? Well, that's some, something you know, we can explore through both double counting rules and uh, you know alternative products that can be used in those marketplaces. Uh, we'll be exploring labeling. Um, so gold standard labeled CDM credits historically, and we'll explore whether we should could should do that for forestry. Uh, we'll explore some of the new domestic markets like the Chinese CER market. Should we label there, for example? And so if you see an opportunity or a value in gold standard labeling, any kind of domestic compliance scheme, uh, we, we'd be interested to hear from you on that. Um, uh, yeah, so so a, a number of things coming forward in the in the fall this year. So do look out. If you have any expertise or interest in additionality, double counting, it's a particularly a particular type of expertise and interest. You, know, you either love it or hate it. And I think if any of you do have fall on the love side of that, then um, then drop us a line and we can we can make sure you're targeted and included in that discussion. Um, there's some newer applications that have already been designed uh, and some that are coming up. So environmental markets, uh, we've recently, as I say, introduced renewable energy certificate labeling for renewable energy projects. And we're exploring other ecosystem services and SDG methodologies there. Uh, results-based finance for development is a really interesting um, area of exploration. We're working with a couple of large impact investment funds, so funds that invest in project types uh, for profit, uh, but also embed within that SDG impact as a core uh, due diligence requirement. And we're working with those funds to establish how gold standard for the global goals could be used to form their due diligence, their monitoring and evaluation, and their MRV. Um, and so the interesting thing there for you guys is that you know a project could either be uh, something that the fund wants to invest in and would need to progress towards uh, GS certification, or potentially the opposite, that a project's already GS certified 
then that could be an entry point to join the impact investment fund. So those funds aren't necessarily based on carbon credits. There's flexibility for that, but they, they're certainly an area of interesting finance, I think, for investable projects. Uh, so look out for more on that soon too. Uh, something we're really excited by and and will be a core a core pillar really of our land use approach is corporate reporting. I know many of your projects are part of corporate supply chain thinking. And so we'll be um, developing guidelines that allow corporates to use gold standard for the global goals to certify the emissions reductions from their projects and, and programs in their supply chain uh, for the purpose of scope three reporting to science-based targets, CDP, et cetera. Um, and so um, if, you know, with those, you know, with those kind of investments uh, we, we, and, and that, those kind of recognitions from some of those partners, uh, there'll be a whole heap of demand there, particularly if you're already embedded in the corporate reporting world. Um, I think that's a pretty exciting one. Uh, we will be uh, testing that in land use first and foremost. So like I say, some of you might already be in that space um, and there's a new opportunity there coming forward. Uh, and then lastly, large scale development. So I showed you the cities module already, the gold standard for sustainable urban development. I appreciate that's not really a forestry thing unless you count urban forestry, which is possible. Uh, but I wanted to highlight it because something else we'll look at as well is how we um, how we certify programs of sustainable landscape change, for example, at scale. And so to do that, we would we would explore um, uh, you know, creating a context module in that sense. So you know, how could we, uh, a sustainable landscape change module for programs and projects, really. Uh, and so again, if people see opportunities in that or have an interest or uh, expertise in that area, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so really some exciting new applications that are all, designed to improve our resilience, uh, our focus, and, and specifically on new areas of demand uh, alongside carbon credits. Um, and so just finally, just some upcoming milestones. <clears throat> As I say, all projects will transition to gold standard for the global goals uh, from the 1st of March 2018. You can do it before. If you, if you want to do it before that, uh, reach out to us. We're developing the process right now, and so uh, we can work with you. Um, so, so coming in earlier, you know, we'll be looking to you to help us shape that process. And so, uh, if you've got the interest and the time to do that, then we'd uh, we'd certainly welcome submissions. Uh, the gender responsive framework will allow uh, a wide range of projects to quantify gender impacts, partic particularly, I suspect. Uh, women's economic empowerment, uh, potentially reduced um, drudgery, that kind of thing. Uh, that will be released in October 2018. Uh, that's going to be an optional methodology that you can apply if you choose. Uh, I mentioned the consultation on additionality and ongoing financial needs and some of the post-Paris policies. Uh, you'll probably see over the next few years a series of consultations around uh, Paris, um, <coughs> excuse me, Paris-based policy uh, items. Uh, so do look out for those, and, and uh, we'd love you to participate. Uh, at the standards level, we are going to be seeking ICL membership. So if you don't know ICL, that's a standard for standards. Uh, members include Fairtrade, FSC, MSC, uh, Boots, Rainforest Alliance, so some of the biggest names in sustainable development standards. Uh, it's really um, a kind of indirect effect on you as project developers, I suspect. It's a system of best practice for the good governance of standards. Uh, so what you'll see from us is, 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 is more and more clarity around certification, around claims, around auditors uh, and around um, uh, transparency and stakeholder consultations. Uh, I would say Gold Standard is already pretty good at those things. We're not that far off ICL membership, but ICL really will tighten us up and make us best practice. And I'm, I'm thoroughly excited about that professional, like that further professionalization of Gold Standard. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned you know new SDG reporting tools on the one hand. So perhaps tools that report on multiple SDG contributions, uh, but not necessarily at the kind of carbon credit level of rigor. Uh, we see a lot of demand for that, particularly from corporates. And, uh, and I think in land use, you can imagine something like an agriculture SDG compass tool that allows you to report on all the SDG impacts. Uh, and then at the kind of methodological level where we want to issue any commercial products or results-based finance statements, for example, um, you know, you can see examples of that, like our A Daily's cook stove methodology. Uh, they tend to be sort of higher end, more rigorous, uh, you know, um, to apply. Uh, but they, that's that's for a specific internationally standardized metric that allows you to access certain marketplaces. Um, so you may see some of those get developed. If you, if you see a market or a demand for such a thing, then we'd be interested to hear from you on that as well. Uh, and that's really it from a, a presentation perspective. Um, Thank you very much for listening. If you want to listen back to this or any of the webinars, as I say, they're on the YouTube channel. Um, if you drop a question now into the questions box, I'll leave it open for a few minutes to, to let you guys drop questions in. Then I'll try and work through those now. Uh, <clears throat> anything I can't answer now or where we need to make sure we're giving consistent answers, I'll take away and we'll include that in the circulation afterwards. 
if you have a question that pops into your head after the webinar, that always happens to me, to tell the truth. Uh, always when the webinar closes, I think of my questions, then you can send it to help at goldstandard.org. You can also use that channel if you have a more um, you know, you want to, you have a more kind of commercially sensitive question or something you wanted to ask, or a question that's very specific to your project timeline. Um, drop it to help at Gold Standard, and we'll make sure we refer to you on that. So, thank you very much for for listening to that that webinar. Uh, I'll just dive into the question. There's a question being asked already, so I'll just respond to that question, um, and then I'll leave it open for a, a few minutes. Um, then um, uh, we'll you know, leave it open for a few minutes for others to drop questions in. If there's no more questions, then we'll close the webinar. Uh, we have a question actually. So if you're prepared to label CDM AR carbon credits, could that result in more saleable GSVRs rather than the currently unattractive TCERs or ICERs? I, I think the truthful answer to that question is uh, we're not sure. It's something to be explored. Um, so I, I think when we come to decide whether we want to label something like a Chinese CER or, or forestry CERs, uh, then there's uh, a technical question. So, you know, what, what do we need to do from a technical perspective to label those? Um, you know, do they, are, they, are they a good fit for gold standard? Uh, is there a demand for that? And, and the flip side of that question, the third question is, is, does it kind of detract from any other area of gold standard? So I think that's a valid question to ask. Uh, and that's something that we'll carefully consider. Does it does it damage any other part of gold standard demand? Does it undermine any, any other users? Is is certainly part of any analysis that we do. Uh, Bill, if you have thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them. I know you you know you've got some experience there with CDM for the for better and worse. Um, so if you you know if you see a benefit to that or a disbenefit to that, then then totally open. So right now um, there's no firm decision on whether we should label or shouldn't label. Uh, forestry CERs, uh, it's, it's something that we, we'd be interested in considering. So very, very much open to, to discussion and thoughts on that. So Bill, I'd really welcome, uh, if you have a moment when you're not super busy, if that ever happens to you, Bill, then, um, then do drop us a line and let us know your thoughts on that. Um, so I don't see any other questions there. I'll leave it open for sort of 10, 15 seconds for people to drop them in. Uh, if not, then I'll, I'll, I'll assume the webinar closed and I'll look out for questions from you if you have any at help at goldstandard.org. Uh, if for some reason you're interested in hearing this webinar again, we're running it again this evening at 6 o'clock GMT, 7 o'clock CT. Um, it'll be the same presentation and opportunity for a different set of time zone uh, developers to, um, to raise questions with us. Um, but you, you're welcome to rejoin that. It'll be recorded also. Okay. Um, so with no further questions, I'll, um, I'll, I'll end the webinar there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for those of you that participated in the long development process. We had uh, several rounds of targeted consultation. We had a round of, of, of early submission uh, of, of the terms of reference for goal standard for the global goals. We had a 60-day consultation, a 30-day consultation, uh, at least a dozen presentations at various COPs, Innovate for Climate, the Gold Standard Conference, uh, bilateral conversations with many of you from myself and with, with members of the Secretariat. So uh, wherever you've participated, whether it's in written form or, or verbal form or just through your ongoing support to Gold Standard, thank you so much. Um, we hope you're excited about Gold Standard for the Global Goals. Um, I appreciate it can be daunting to take on new standard documents, um, but you know, we'll, we'll, we're, we're here to help um, and we look forward to developing it further. Um, thanks very much, everybody. I'll end it there. Thanks so much for joining.